I think I'm going to start recording. So just a couple of admin matters. So that four is happening this week. So please go to your tutorial today or tomorrow. You will get your older um, activities back. And do visit the tab homework info. It contains important PDFs and important information. And please redo all tutorial problems. And don't forget to do the exercises in the textbook. So as you know, um, next week you will have to hand in homework four in the tutorial. So next week, not this week, next week you will have to hand in homework four. And make sure you write your name, surname, and student number on the first page of your homework. And there will be a class test next week in the tutorial. So a mock version of the class test is already on ClickUp for you to look at over the weekend. Are there any admin questions before we get digging into chapter 3.3? I hope everything is clear. And I hope you have pen and paper. Good morning if you've just joined. It's so nice to have a maths lesson, even though it's online. Alrighty. So we're busy with chapter three. And today we're going to talk about tangent planes. So we have this beautiful diagram over here that the blue is a surface z equal to f x y. So by now you're really good at sketching surfaces. You've done that in chapter one. And if you pick a point on the surface, the point um, P, uh, remember this is in 3D. So the coordinates of point P will be A, B, F, A, B. And here's the definition. Let f be a function of two variables with domain and open set D, subset of R2, containing the point AB, such that f is differentiable at AB. Then the tangent plane is given by this set. So it's a set of all 3D vectors where the normal dotted with the vector minus the point equals zero. So if you've forgotten, the notation for planes in 3D, have a look in your one to four notes. So this is called the tangent plane to the graph of F of F at the point AB, FAB. And if you do the dot product and you rewrite it and you solve for Z, you get this. Can I get a smiley face? That's, you have done this at home. You've done that little pencil calculation. You took that vector, you dotted with that vector, and you simplified it and you you got z on its own and you got this it is important that you do these extra calculations at home you you need to get your hands dirty doing mathematics so we see that z equals this all right so it's very easy to remember so z is f at the the 2d vector plus f partial x the 2d vector x minus a because this is f partial x plus f partial y at the point, and because it's f partial y, it's y minus b. So it's a very easy formula to remember. All right, so you need to know it off the heart. So this is the Cartesian equation for t. And just to emphasize it again, t is a plane, and the normal is minus fx at the point, comma, minus fy at the point, comma, 1. All right, and I'm just adding this definition. So if f is differentiable at the point a, b, then the linear approximation of f at the point a, b is defined by this function of two variables. So we're taking the right hand side and we're using it to define function L, which is a function of two variables. It's just definitions. Are there any questions? Just definitions and you've got to know it off by heart. So for 218, you just have to know these definitions off by heart. So the equation of the plane, the tangent plane, and the equation for the linear approximation. You can see they are related, okay? But they are different objects. 
a plane is a specific object in 3D and the linear approximation is a function of two variables. So don't confuse the two ideas. You have a plane and you have a function of two variables. All right, so make sure you are wide awake when you are doing mathematics. All righty, so what kind of questions can you expect in the exam? Here is a question. So take this function of two variables. We want to find the tangent plane at the point 1, 1, 3. So you can see if x is 1 and y is 1, and you plug it into the function, the output is 3. So you can clearly see this point is on the surface. Alrighty. So, but just to show the marker, you've noticed that. Start off by saying, okay, the function is 3x squared plus xy minus y squared. And if I plug in this 2D vector into the function, I get 3. And now by theorem 55, who can tell me what f partial x is? Who can tell me what f partial x is? I hope you've been practicing theorem 55. So if it's a function of two variables, so f partial x, you treat y as a constant. Lizuku, can I get 6x plus y? Lizuku, can I get 6x plus y? So f partial x at the point 1, 1 is equal to 7. Can somebody tell me what f partial y is? So now you treat x as a constant, and you do partial derivatives with respect to y. Lizuka, you're making typing er errors. Yep. It's x minus 2y. So if partial y at the point 1, 1, double check my maths, double check my calculations. Remember, I don't have a calculator because you don't have a calculator for semester test one and the exam. So please double check my calculators. All right. <laughs> it's morning already. All right. So, um, um, so if, if you bought, you, you can verify if is differentiable at 1, 1. So tangent plane exists at the point 1, 1, 3. Remember, if you draw the surface, the surface will be in 3D. So first we quickly tell the marker because the function is differentiable at the point we know that the tangent plane exists and knowing that the tangent plane exists we can write down the equation you can use theorem 67 miss dube miss dube you can use theorem 67 that is a great alternative you can also use theorem 67 to verify differentiability at the point all right so now we know that the tangent plane exists and now we can give the equation for the tangent plane. So it's always good to first give the formula. So Z is F at the point plus F partial X at the point X minus one plus F partial Y at the point Y minus one. Can I get a smiley face that you guys see why I wrote down the function, the function at the point F X, F X at the point. F y, F y at the point, all right? And now we know that the function is differentiable at the point one one, so the tangent plane exists, and so we end up getting this. All right, and now we are happy because now we can use our values. So we know that that is three, that is seven, x minus one, and that is minus, so it's minus y minus one. Brackets are your friends. When you do mathematics, back brackets are your friends. And when the dust settles, you should get z is equal to 7x minus y minus 3. So double check that you agree with that. Double check that you agree with that. So there is the Cartesian equation. All right. Are there any questions? So it's basically just apply the formula and just go for it. Always read the problem. So use part A and linearly approximate the function when you plug in 1.1 comma 0.9. So 
as I said, here we have the plane. This is a plane. This is the Cartesian equation of the plane. So what I would do is I would write down the linear approximation is defined by 7x minus y minus 3. Can I get a yes that this is the formula for the linear approximation of the function at this specific point? So just take the right hand side. So if you've got the plane in the form z is equal to something, this is the linear approximation. All right. And now what we do next is we do the following. So we say that the function at the point 1.1 comma 0 0.9 is approximately when I plug in 1.1 comma 0 0.9 into the linear approximation. And so in this case, it becomes 7 times 1.1 minus 0 0.9 minus 3. And who can tell me what this value is without a calculator? So L is a function of two variables. Great. And now we plug it in. You can see 1 is close to 1.1. 0 0.9 is close to 1. What is this without a calculator? Well done. I agree with the majority. It is 3.8. All right. I was bored this morning. So I just quickly looked at the real value. I was bored this morning and I quickly looked at the real value. So I used my calculator to do the real value and it was 3.81. And so it was, it is close. Can I get a smiley face that you see? This time around, the linear approximation is actually very close to the real value. It only differed in the second decimal place. So typically, this calculation you can do by hand. All right. Um, I had plenty to do, so I, I, I wanted to make sure that I had this spot on. So if you ask yourself, why is this linear approximation such fun? Because you can have something like this. You can have k is equal to the square root of x cubed plus y squared. So k is a function of two variables. And you know, if you plug in 0, 1 into k, it's equal to 1. So you can calculate the linear approximation of k at the point 0, 1. And then you can work out k, let's say, um, 0 0.2 comma 0 0.9 without technology. So one advantage of doing these things is being able to, for functions of two variables, if at the point zero one, it's easy to do with a calculator, and then you can pick a point close to zero one. So maybe the point zero point two, zero point nine, then you can do it without technology. So it's pretty cool. So you get an, an approximation. And sometimes, in a lot of cases, the approximation does well. Alrighty. Now I'm going to get to part C. Part C is the tricky part. Let me quickly repeat the problem. Give an Cartesian plane perpendicular to the one found in A. So be a little bit playful in this problem. All right. So let's quickly draw it. So here I have two planes. So it's a rough sketch. It's a rough sketch. So T is a tangent plane and P is the other plane. So we know that the normal of T, can I get a smiley face that you will memorize this formula? So minus F partial X at the point, minus F partial Y at the point, comma one. And so in this case, it works out. Can I get smiley faces in the chat? So it works out to be this. So please draw. So please draw. All right. So the tangent plane has a normal given by this formula. And so using the values in A, we get minus 7, 1, 1. All right. Now, we want the two planes to be perpendicular. Who can tell me in the chat what does that mean? So in P, that is the normal of plane P. 
such that who can tell me what we want? Yes, the dot product of the norm should equal to zero. You are making my heart warm and fuzzy this morning. Can I get a smiley face that this is what we want? That the normal of that plane dotted with the normal of that plane is equal to zero. That is how you turn the words into an equation. The normal of plane T dotted with the normal of plane P is equal to zero. All right. And so um, now we can say note minus seven one one dotted with um, I think I'm going to do the following. I think I'm going to do the following. I'm going to I'm going to say if the first coordinate is one, the second coordinate is one. What should the last coordinate be? What should the last coordinate be? So if this vector dotted that vector. So here I'm being playful. Here I'm being creative. Mbali is saying six. Yep, I agree with that. I agree with that. So or make your own or make your own. All right, so I've just made one. You can make your own. Just make sure that the normal of the the two normals, if you dot them, that's equal to zero. So I will say, so one answer is x plus y plus six z equal to 2022. Are there any questions on this problem? Are there any questions on this problem? So the answer to C is not unique, but here is one plane that is perpendicular to the plane given in A. And I hope it also demonstrates, Jaden, we are living in the year 2022. We are living in the year 22. But if you want to, you can make it X plus Y plus 6Z equal to 18 or your favorite integer. Jaden, <laughs> so what we care about here, the two planes are perpendicular. So if you take the respective norm, so you dot it, it's equal to zero. The rest is up to you to make your own example. Jaden, can I get a smiley face? The answer is not unique. You can use any number. You don't have to use 2022. Okay. All right. Great. It's now, let's give you another fun problem to do. All right, hint, hint for semester test one. F is a function of two variables. Find all points on the graph of F such that T, foot script P is the, so T foot script P is defined as the tangent plane at point P. So we want to find all the points on the surface or on the graph of F such that TP is parallel to the XY plane. So before I go any further, can anybody tell me what is the XY plane? What is the equation for the XY plane? XY plane is what? You know this, yep. Z is equal to zero. Can I get a smiley face that you guys agree? We can write this as zero X plus zero Y plus one Z equal to zero. Can I get a smiley face that you guys agree with this? Can anybody tell me why do I write it in this form? Why do I write Z equal to zero in this form? Think of the previous problem. Why do I write to get the norm? You guys are making my heart warm and fuzzy. So the normal is zero zero one all right so the xy plane is when z equal to zero and so the norm is zero zero one all right now this is a non-trivial problem so who can tell me what is a typical trick to attacking a non-trivial problem you read you think and what else do i like saying you do <laughs> what, what i mean clarica it is <laughs> it's a problem that catches students that 
Don't do maths every day. Erika, can I get a smiley face? So by that, I mean, it is a problem that catches students that don't do maths every day. And spot on the money, you draw. Can I get smiley faces that you guys are happy? If you can, draw. It sometimes helps you to get out of trouble. It sometimes helps you to try things. Okay, so I'm not going to do a good job of um, drawing this surface, but this is point B, and this is the tangent, all right? And so we know that those two planes are what? So this is the plane Z equal to zero. What's the key word here? Yes. They are parallel. This is the word that I would underline. When you read this problem, you think, and I would underline the word parallel. And Marco, spot on the money. Spot on the money. So this is how I would continue this problem. So I would say this normal is 0, 0, 001. Um, let's call this normal M. So M is equal to, can I get a smiley face that you see? So we let P be the point A, B, F, A, B. So the normal of the tangent plane is given by this. Can I get a smiley face that you see that this formula is again making an, an appearance? So you are seeing several problems where I am using this result. So the one plane, we know it's normal, zero, zero, 001. Can I get more smiley faces? Please be more alive. <laughs> Please be more alive. And the normal of the tangent plane at point P is given by this formula, which you will write down 10 times today. All right. And so we know the planes are parallel. So we want a K, which is a real number such that um, M is equal to K times N. This is very important. Two planes are parallel if their normals are scalar multiples of one another. And I'm stopping here. Your homework this weekend is now to set up the system and solve for A, B, and K. Are there any questions? So I've just started this problem. I've just started this problem, making sure you start the problem in the right direction. But the actual calculation I am leaving you to do. So you do it, your friend do it, and you guys compare answers. You can even share your solutions to one another and make sure that you write beautiful solutions to each other, to yourself, to the marker. Any questions, comments? I think it's a beautiful problem to ask in semester test one. You can see how we're putting a lot of information from first year mathematics and 218 together to solve this problem. So please do this problem this weekend. Okay, if there aren't any questions, Let's move on. All right. Now, I want to give this little definition. So, if at the point AB, so now we have if it's a function of two variables, if at the point AB it is the directional derivative exists, we can form the following 3D vector. So, the textbook donated F bar dash footscript U, and who can tell me what is special about U? There's a specific reason why we use U. When you do directional derivatives, the keyword is unit. 
All right, it's very important. We caught out people in last week's tutorial playing with non-unit vectors. When you calculate unit vectors, it, when you calculate directional derivatives, it must be a unit vector. So some students were caught when we were marking last week's tutorial playing with non-unit vectors, all right? So we're using U because the word unit starts with U. So it is the following 3D vector. So the first component is U1, the next component is U2, and the third component is the directional derivative of F at the point AB in the direction of a unit vector U. So given a function and a point and a unit vector, we can form the following 3D vector that is denoted by F bar dash foot script U bar zero. All right. Now, theorem 77 is a beautiful result that says the following. Let F be a function of two variables whose domain is an open subset of R2 containing the point AB. Assume F is differentiable at the point AB. So technically, if you want to, um, differentiability at the point is equivalent to a tangent plane to exist. And if a tangent plane exists, it's equivalent that F is differentiable at the point. Now, denote by vector n bar, the normal of the tangent plane t to the graph of f at a, b, then if you form these vectors and if you dot it with n, it's equal to zero for every unit vector u. Can I get five people to write the word every in the chat? So when you read a definition or a theorem, there are sometimes keywords. So here, this is true for every unit vector u. This is true. Thank you, everybody, for the everys. Thank you, everybody, for the everys. All right. So what this is essentially saying is that if you take the normal, which we know by now is given by this formula, and we form these vectors f bar dash um, foot script u bar zero, which is u1, the first component of vector u, u2, the second component of vector u, and the third component is the value of the directional derivative you get, that this vector dotted with that vector is zero. So if you want to, you can turn this into a line. You can turn this into a line. So for every unit vector u, you can form the following line. So line L foot script u is defined as the point P, where we know it's differentiable, where we know there's a tangent plane. So it's of the form the point a b f a b plus t and this vector so we turn the directional derivative of that value into a 3d vector and so we form the line l u and what this theorem is saying is that all of those lines lie in the tangent plane so if you want to visualize this so a little bit of thinking but pick a unit vector u Calculate the directional derivative, and then you form the following line, which in my diagram is denoted by L foot script U bar, that all of those lines lie in this tangent plane. So this line is a subset of T. So in a nutshell, this is what theorem 77 says. Any questions? Just quickly want to do a poll. The theorem is a mouthful. The theorem is a mouthful. And it is something that you need to rethink about this weekend. So if you have a surface, you pick a point, you construct a tangent plane. And then at that point, you pick any unit vector u and you form these lines in this manner then all of those lines will be sitting in the same plane. Okay, so theorem 77 just helps us with the visual side of what is going on here. All right, so I'm gonna wait for six more people to vote. So do not get lost between vectors, lines, and planes. So don't get lost between vectors, lines, and planes. So, 47 is happy. 
nine, a little bit of thinking to do this weekend. All right. Now, one way you can interpret this is the following. If you plot all of these arrows, so if bar dash, so pick a unit vector u and you plot all of these vectors or these arrows, then if all of those arrows are complained uh, coplanar, so you can embed them in the same plane, then it means that f is differentiable at the point a, b. But let's say, and four years ago, we actually asked this question in a semester test. Let's say you pick three directions, a, b, c, so three unit vectors, a, b, c, and you ended up calculating these vectors. So let's say this is the one arrow you got, this is the other arrow you got, and this is the other arrow you, that you got. And if it turns out that the three unit vectors that you pick and you form these three vectors, that they are non-coplanar, then it means that F is not differentiable at the point A, B. So this is an alternative to show non-differentiability at a point. Okay. So here is another way of looking at theorem 77. So for any vector u, if you form those arrows in this manner and they all lie in the same plane, then it means f is differentiable at that point. But if you find three directions whose corresponding arrows are not lying in the same plane, then it means f is not differentiable at that point. And in some sense, this idea of coplanar links up with linear dependence and I'm sure you've done that in 211. Have you have, have you done linear dependence in 211 yet? Yes, no? Marco saying yes? Yep. So there is a link between multivariable calculus and linear algebra. Alrighty, so some food for thought. All right. Now that is the end of chapter 3.3. I want to now move on to chapter 3.4. It's a fun little chapter because we have the chain rule for functions of one variable. Let me remind you one way to state it. So if f and g are functions of one variable such that f is differentiable at a and g is differentiable at f a, then the function defined by that y equal to h x equal to g f x is differentiable at a given by this formula. Yes, Marco. So um, if it changed, we will let you know, but the scope for semester test one at the moment is chapter one, two, three point three. Marco, can I get a smiley face? So if it changed, we will let you know, but for now the scope for semester test one is everything in chapter one, everything in chapter two, up until chapter 3.3. .3. All righty. But I want to use this opportunity to say we can do lots of fun, fun things with functions of many variables. And one is the chain rule. So if you let u equal to fx, then we see that y is equal to gu. So y is a function of u because y is gu. u is a function of x because y is equal to fx. So we have this little tree diagram. And you can see when x is a, u will be fa. Can I get smiley faces in the chat that you see what I'm doing here? I, one way to quote the chain rule is as follows. So you have an outside function G, you have an inside function F, but that allows you to draw this tree diagram. Are you guys awake? And I get some smiley faces. This is the chain rule for the function of one variable. All right. It may look a little bit different to what you typically see in first year, but this is one way you can donate the chain rule. So what you can say is the following is 
y is ultimately a function of x. So you can differentiate y with respect to x and plug in a. So that is the left hand side, h dash a. All right. And, and how do you get the right hand side, Jaden? Jaden, can I get a frowny face? Jaden, can I get a frowny face? Okay. Um, I will upload um, something under my tab, Dr. Wiggins notes later today. I hope I can find it. But what you do is the following. You see a tree has, this tree has two branches. So the first branch will be um, the derivative of this branch, which is F dash A. So the derivative of the first branch, so the derivative of the first branch will be F dash plugging in this value. The derivative of the second branch will be G dash plugging in the value F A. Can I get smiley faces that you guys see this? Can I get smiley faces that you see this? So here my value that I'm plugging in is FA. Here the value that I'm plugging in is A. So symbolically, this is a way of remembering the chain rule. All right. Now, we can have fun. So if we have functions of many variables and we go crazy composing functions in crazy ways, how do we state the chain rule in those scenarios? That is a very good question to ask, right? So here is one such an, an example, right? Please bear with me. So let D be a subset of R to be open, let F be a map from D to R be differentiable at the point AB, which is the element of D, and assume that U and V are functions of one variable such that if you plug C, the real number C into U, you get A, and if you plug C into V, you get B. And we also want that U and V are differentiable at C. And then we can define the following function given by GT is equal to FUT comma VT. Can I get a yes that you see what is going on here? You have three functions. F, which is a function of two variables. U, which is a function of one variable. V, which is a function of one variable. And now we define G to be a function of one variable in this manner. So we're creating new functions from old functions. So it's, it's like baking a cake. You have F, which is a function of two variables, U and V, which is a function of one variable. Can I get another yes? And from those three functions, Makata, <laughs> please <laughs> re-look at this later today. Uh, Makata, can I get a smiley face? All that I'm doing is with functions F, U and V, I form a new function G in this manner. Makata, from... And here's my tree diagram. G is made out of U and V, and U is a function of T, and V is a function of T. Makata, can I get a smiley face? So here's my tree diagram. G is made out of U and V, U is a function of T, and V is a function of T. And can I get more smiley faces? The problem is saying that if T is equal to C, then uc is a and vc is b. So this is the values. So when t has a value of c, u has a value in a, and v has a value of b from the description of the theorem. Can I get more smiley faces? Guys, talk to me. Maths is going to get exciting. And if you can, please read ahead in the textbook. Please read ahead in the textbook. So just like first year, we want a formula for the derivative of G. We want a formula for the derivative of G. So if you create a new function from old functions in this manner, using components and composition, we want a formula for the derivative. 
So if all of that is in place, then G is ultimately a function of T, the leaves, and G is differentiable at C, and we will give the formula in a moment. So the question is, so when we get a function of two variables, we, could, we should break it down into Mercato. This is not always possible. Okay, so please stay behind. All right, so for theorem 78, you have f u and v and you make a new function all right makata you you want to do reverse engineering makata so for this theorem you have u and v which are functions of one variable with nice conditions f is a function of two variables with a nice condition yes clarica clarica do you see G ultimately depends on T. Clarica, can I get a smiley face that you see? G ultimately depends on T. If you know T, you can work out the first component of F and the second component of F. And when you plug it into F, you get an output. So my table on the left is clarifying that. It, it, it is getting tricky. And what it says is the following that no, not only is the new function g, a, a, a function of one variable t, but we can differentiate it. It's differentiable at c, and we have a formula for the derivative. And the way to see the formula for the derivative is the following. So g dash c is two branches. You have two branches happening. And I think I'm going to label the branches so that you don't get lost. Okay, so the branch ut becomes this because u dash at c, um, this branch becomes this term. So you take f, you partial differentiate with respect to u, and you plug in the, the values on that level. vt becomes this, and then that branch becomes this. So this is the pink part. This is the pink path. And this is the blue path. So don't memorize the formula. Draw the tree and interpret the tree. Are there any questions? So to travel to T, you can do V partial V at the point AB. And then the last part is V is a function of one variable. So it's a plain derivative plug in C. The pink path, which is the one on the left, you can go V partial U at the point AB, plug in U dash C. Hope you are writing down the formula and you are making the link between the tree diagram and the formula. So, do you see the link? For now, I want you to see the link. Don't memorize this formula. Don't memorize the formula. Draw the tree and make sure you can interpret the tree into an equation. And you all know that trees are vital because trees give, give us oxygen. It stores carbon. It purifies air and it helps to combat climate change. And you're going to need trees to understand chapter 3.4 which may be in semester test one, it's still undecided. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? So the trick to chapter 3.4 is drawing trees, drawing trees and being able to go from the tree to the appropriate formula. I don't hear any questions. Can I get nine more people to vote? So how do you prove it? It is an exercise in the textbook. It is an exercise in the textbook. So make sure you draw the tree diagram. <laughs> Not gonna work, Neil. <laughs> if you do that, Neil, <laughs> you're going to get zero marks. Remember, Neil, you, you got to be doing 12 hours of maths per week. Neil, can I get a smiley face that you are doing 
12 hours of 218 work per week. Good. All right. So let's see a problem where we apply this theorem. All right. So it's your homework. Neil, let me emphasize this is your homework this weekend. Your homework, Neil. You got to do it. All right. So let's, let's, uh, I'm taking the textbook example. So f is a function of two variables, x to the 4 plus xy. And gt is defined by f of t squared plus 1, t cubed plus t, where t is a real number. And we want to find the derivative when I plug in minus 1 into g into two ways. And we're going to do this calculation. So let's do it the old way. Can I get a smiley face that you agree that GT is defined by F of T squared plus one comma T cubed plus T because that is what it's given. Can I get a yes in the chat? Can I get a yes in the chat? Talk to me. So repeating what's given. Okay. And now remember, F is a function of two variables. So applying the definition F of this gives you the first component raised to the power of 4 plus the first component times the second component. So this is crucial. Can I get a smiley face that you see that g is ultimately a function of one variable? So in this setup, g is ultimately a function of one variable. Great. Now, Let's differentiate G. Which two rules do we use to differentiate G? Yes, Makato. Chapter 3.4, we got to love trees. Trees are vital. It gives us oxygen. It stores carbon. You got to love trees. Chain is the one rule, Jaden. What is the other rule you're going to use? Yes, you, you're going to use the chain rule and the product rule. So tell the marker, using the chain rule and using the product rule, the derivative, and I hope you double check my mathematics, that it becomes block to the four. So it's four times block cubed times the derivative of the block, which is 2t. Here I'm using the product rule. So it's the first the derivative of the first part times the second part plus the first part times the derivative of the second part, which is 3t squared plus 1. And only at the end, I plug in minus one. So I get four times, if I plug in minus one, this becomes eight, this becomes minus two. If I plug in minus two, that's minus two. Um, if I plug in um, minus one, it becomes that. If I plug in uh, minus one, this becomes two. And this becomes um, three plus one, which is four. And who can tell me what is the numerical value? No, 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 no. D is a function of one variable. So D is not a vector function, Makata. D is not a vector function. Makata, can I get a smiley face? that g is a function of one variable yes we have two people agreeing with minus 52 i agree with minus 52 so it is minus 52. now let's you do this using this brand new theorem this brand new theorem that we have theorem 78. so to do this we let ut be t squared plus one and we let vt be t cubed plus t can i get a smiley face that you agree if we let u be the function t squared plus one function of one variable and v be the function t cubed plus t it becomes an ideal setup for theorem 78 because g is a function of u and v and u is a function of t and v is a function of t so we have this tree diagram popping up we have this tree diagram popping up so to employ theorem 78 we create 
functions u d squared plus one and function v d cubed plus one. So we need to draw the tree, but we also need the values. So when t is minus one, what is u? Can anybody tell me what is u when t is minus one? Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Nicole. It's two. And when t is minus one, what's the value of v? When t is minus one, what's the value of v? Be careful with your signs. It's minus two. Double check your signs. It's minus two. So now we can continue and say by theorem 78. So don't memorize theorem 78. Just draw the tree. So g dash of minus one is equal to you travel down the one branch. So it's f partial u at the point two minus two times u dash at minus one plus f partial v. That's the second branch at the point two minus two. So you've got to make sure you don't make numerical mistakes. And now let's quickly do the math. So u two is equal to t squared plus one. What's the derivative of u? What's the derivative of u, anybody? Yeah, it's 2t. You see, it's very easy. And so if you plug in minus 1, it becomes minus 2. And if you write down v, which is t cubed plus t, and you do the derivative, that becomes 3t squared plus 1. So what happens if you plug minus 1 into v dash? What happens if you plug minus 1 into v dash? Anybody? Nicole is getting 4. Yep. And so it is indeed four. And so just to remind ourselves, f is a function of two variables. It's u to the four plus uv. So what is f partial u? Notice I write f partial u at the point uv to emphasize it's a function of two variables. What's f partial u? F partial u, anybody? Yep. You treat v as a constant and it becomes this. So f partial u, and now you're using the point two minus two, this becomes 30. And then we have f partial v. Who can tell me what f partial v is? f partial v. Thomas is saying u. Do we, guys, do we agree with you? Yes, no? Yep. Well done, Mr. Patel. It is indeed u. So f partial v at the point 2 minus 2, that becomes 2. So now we use g dash minus 1 is equal to f partial u at the specific value, which is 30, times u dash at that specific point is minus 2, plus f partial v, that's 2, and then v dash, which is 4. And who can tell me what is this numerical value? What is this numerical value? No calculators. And we got 52 again. We get 52 again. All right. Um, how cool is this? So, so as I said, to prove this, So Jaden, always read the question. If the question doesn't specify, you can use any method that you want to use. You can use any method that you want to use. Okay, so I think this is a perfect